ever applied for a job. And one of the difficulties is on the application, you have to list your old jobs and then reason for leaving. They just give you a little box. There's a whole long story. I left my first job because I ran off to Colorado with a three-finger cellist. His name was Sebastian. We met when we were in high school. And he was a misfit. He was a troubled. His, his father was a, a jazz musician who'd run off and left his wife and four children. And that didn't happen in my neighborhood. You know, like fathers, I didn't grow up in Greenwich Village. You know, fathers were jazz musicians in my neighborhood. Fathers worked in the steel mills or in offices. So he, he was different. And, and also, he'd, he'd blown off his pinky finger playing with fireworks. He, he was bad news. But I was a misfit, too. You know, like, I, I didn't go to the mall and I wrote really bad poetry. I used all of these and those to make it sound classy, you know. And so, you know, so, 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 so Sebastian, I, I was walking home from school one day holding a pen, and he ran up behind me, and, and he grabbed the pen and said, can I borrow your pen? And I said, no. And we were walking home, and I wouldn't let go of the pen, and he didn't let go of the pen, and he walked me all the way home, and we stood there outside my house just talking, and he was so charming, you know? I mean, he was such a badass, but he had this mischievous eyes and this dark curly hair, and, and I was thinking of the folk song, The Gypsy Rover, and he was the Gypsy Rover, and, and we, we just stood there talking until it got dark, and then I finally let go of the pen, foreshadowing. <laughs> So we started hanging out, and he played the cello. I mean, he, he just had the three fingers. He had, like, alternate fingering, but, but it was beautiful music. And his mother worked, so nobody was home at his house. And so every day after school, I would go to his place, and he'd play the cello, and we'd talk, and I'd read him my poems. And, and, we, and we were, we were um, kindred spirits. We were kindred spirits. And my mother started to worry about me hanging out with him all the time, and it was unchaperoned. And we hadn't really, I mean, we, you know, did stuff, but we didn't do all the stuff. And, and, and she, you know, and she was like, Margie, he could charm the birds out of the trees, but he is not a nice boy. So she gave me a book, Ann Landers Talks to Teens. <laughs> And it was hundreds of letters from girls who had ruined their lives by letting boys go all the way. Remember, I'm older than a lot of you. This was before the sexual revolution. This is when, like, a girl, you know, there were good girls and bad girls, and, and letter after letter, it was heartbreaking girls who missed the prom because they were stuck home with a baby. Remember, this was before the pill was, was, this was 1969, and it did not become legal for doctors to prescribe the pill to unmarried women until 1972. Yeah. Can we talk about controlling women's bodies? That's a whole other topic. But anyway, you know, and even the girls who didn't get pregnant, their lives were ruined because no decent boy would look at them now. You were supposed to save yourself for marriage. Think of that phrase, yourself. You're not just saving a membrane. You're saving yourself, you know. And, and so I knew if I let him... I was casting my fate, you know. I was going to hang, have to hang out with the greaser girls, even though I was in honors algebra. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew that this, I mean, I took it seriously. I took Ann Lander seriously. It was not a joke to me. But on the other hand, 
He played the cello. <laughs> Every stroke of the bow washed over me like hot buttered love. And I knew these stories weren't going to happen to me because we were in love. We were transcendent. We were like those other girls. We were going to be in love forever. I knew that because I'd seen it in writing in my journal. <laughs> well, forever lasted until spring of sophomore year. Sebastian, you know, he always had a thing against authority. That was one of the appeals. We were against authority and believed in, I don't know, free, freedom. And he stormed into geometry and he tore up his report card and he called the teacher a fascist and he got thrown out of school. And the next time I heard from him, it was a letter from Juvie. <sighs> they they can. They can jail my body, but not my mind. You know that that that, that whole thing. But but I but I didn't I didn't hear from him, and my heart was broken. But life goes on. <laughs> I found a troubled bassoon player <laughs> who wasn't the same. Anyway. I didn't hear from him until eight years later. I had my first job, and it was a, it was a tough time for I had a job. I was writing um, educational film, film strips to teach remedial math. Maybe maybe you've seen my work <laughs> using decimals. You know that was and you know, it was a, it wasn't the best topic, but I made it interesting. Like all my. Characters in my word problems had these elaborate backstories. <laughs> like you knew why Cece was leaving Chicago on a train going 55 miles per hour. She had somewhere to be. <laughs> anyway, um, but I was really lonely. It was that time after college where I'd moved back to Chicago, but I hadn't found a friend group yet. and. You know, I was just writing these film strips, which my job was mostly staring at blank paper and feeling inadequate, you know, which, as any of you are writers, you, you, you know what that's like. And anyway, anyway, Sebastian called me, and, and, and he was in town, and um, he moved in because, I mean, he'd been, <laughs> he'd been living in a van and um, making a living going to bars and betting people that they couldn't name all 50 states. <laughs> Life hack, most people think they can, but they can't. So, <laughs> I know you're all thinking of them now, right? <laughs> we'll do this after because people really, they, 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 they can't, they can't, I've tried it, they can't. So anyway, he found his father, this father who disappeared without a trace, he found him, and he was living in Boulder, and he talked me into quitting my job, yeah, and going to Boulder. Yeah, you don't need to be in this established Boulder. You know, he made it sound like it was, you know, Buddhists and Napropaths and free spirits, and, and we were going to, we were going to, create, we were going to produce films on topics more interesting than decimals. And, you know, it was, and, and I was so hungry for community at that moment that off we went, off we went. And we found his father, and, and it turned out his father was addicted to cocaine. And Paul started, Sebastian started doing cocaine. And that was okay with me, because I thought if I get addicted to cocaine, I'll get really skinny. But that didn't happen. I just started eating really, really fast. And, you know. and I didn't like the scene. I didn't feel connected. And turned out Sebastian had all these, he'd, he'd get these investors, he had all these projects. He was charming. Like my mother said, he'd get people to invest in projects, but instead of doing the projects, he'd spend it on drugs. So after a couple of weeks, I, I came back home and 
I was applying for a job, and under reason for leaving, I just wrote cello. Thank you.